Hi everyone, I'm Eddie. And I'm Raj. And this is Blood Cancer Talks. We're a podcast dedicated to hematologic malignancies where we bring content experts who live and breathe a particular disease and focus on the latest advances in biology and clinical management. If you haven't already, please rate and review our podcast in whichever app you listen to your podcasts and feel free to reach out to us directly with feedback. We're excited to have recently launched our YouTube channel in case that medium appeals to you to enjoy our podcast, so please check it out. Today, we are excited to talk about the diagnosis and management of mantle cell lymphoma. We are delighted and deeply honored to be joined by mantle cell lymphoma expert, Professor Martin Drayling. Professor Drayling is Professor of Medicine and Head of the Lymphoma Program at Medical Clinic 3 at LMU in Munich in Germany. Professor Drayling is the coordinator of the European MCL Network, which is very important as you're here, and uh, also of the German Low Grade Lymphoma Study Group. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Professor Drayling. To start with, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your background and your clinical and research focus? Well, I've been in hematology for quite a while, and, and I had some interest in lymphoma for a couple of decades, in fact. But anyway, then during my stay in at University of Chicago, I was working at, at that time, totally new concept, which is tumor suppressor gene. So that was, you know, uh, 30 years ago. Anyway, so just by chance, I have analyzed a few mantle cell lymphoma and two out of three had these specific 9P deletion, which is nowadays called P16 tumor suppressor gene. And, and that rose my interest. And when I was coming back to Germany, in fact, mantle cell lymphoma was a clinical disease, which was really really challenging to treat because there was no standard of care. So this is why I picked up on, on mantle cell lymphoma. And during the last 20 years or so, we have uh, worked on this kind of disease specifically. Yeah, great. Yeah, definitely something that you've lived and breathed. Um, we thought we'd start with a case. And so then you can walk us through how you would approach the patient and we can discuss the data and the trials as we go through. So the case is a 55-year-old previously healthy man who presents to hospital with a neck lump, lethargy, and night sweats, and he's found to have widespread lymphadenopathy on PET scan. A biopsy of the neck lump reveals a CD5 positive, CD10 negative, BCL2 positive, BCL6 negative population of intermediate sized lymphocytes with scant cytoplasm, irregular nuclei, uh, and arranged in a mantle zone pattern. Immunohistochemistry is positive for cyclin D1 and SOX11, and FISH demonstrates translocation 1114. The Ki67 is 70% and the LDH is 250. How do you explain a diagnosis of mantle cell lymphoma to patients? Is it an aggressive lymphoma or an indolent lymphoma? Excellent question, because this is exactly my first comment when I talk to my patients. I say, you know, Lymphoma is some kind of cancer. The difference is uh, we have some tools to treat it. And then I say, well, we, there are different two types of uh, lymphoma, the aggressive one and the indolent ones. And, and they're treated in a totally different way. And what is mantle cell lymphoma? It's in between. So there are some indolent and there are also some aggressive cases. Now, for this example, we have, in fact, conflicting information because we do have, on one hand, the mantle cell lymphoma pattern, growth pattern, which is a low risk pattern. And on one, the other hand, we have ki 67 uh, up to 70%, which is definitely a high risk. And then we have LDH, which is somewhat in between on the upper normal value. So what uh, can we make out of that? Uh, to be honest, um, my first approach would be to review pathology. So in Germany, we, we have a network of very experienced so-called reference pathologies, and that would double check specifically the ki 67 I have no doubts about the diagnosis, but just a recent case the other day, he came with his ki 67 of 70%, it was double checked, and then uh, the, the reference value was in between 30 to 40%, which is much more reasonable. Yeah, I was going to ask you, how, how many, what proportion of patients with mantle cell lymphoma do you find are initially diagnosed with something else, like a different type of lymphoma or even CLL? Well, before we had the cyclin D1 immunohistochemistry, uh, really, it was almost impossible. So we missed two thirds of cases. It, it's really the, the, the case just on morphology or immunophenotyping alone. And on the other hand, what we called at that time, mantle cell lymphoma, two thirds were 
whatever different kind of lymphoma subtype. So it was a mess. And now we're applying cyclin D1 or fish detection of 1114. We are able to really be very accurate. And now we are uh, correct in about 98% of cases. And now we learned that there is this spectrum of disease. So either indolent, intermediate, or high-risk mantle cell lymphoma. And um, is there a proportion of mantle cell lymphoma that doesn't have the kind of characteristic cyclin D1 staining and uh, translocation 1114, or do they all um, do they all present with that? No, uh, you know, uh, here we have a, a publication bias, you know, because you always publish the unusual things and the famous cyclin D1 negative mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, in fact, the initial series was published over and over. It was always the same cases. So just to give you a rough estimate, about 99% of patients on mantle cell lymphoma are cyclin D1 negative. We also know what's going on in the 1% cyclin D1 negatives. Uh, sorry, positives. Uh, we also know what's going on in the cyclin D1 negatives and there, uh, cyclin D2 or D3 take over or something, uh, sometimes even cyclin E, but, but anyway, these are exceptional cases. And, and how about uh, translocation 1114? Is that similarly prevalent or, or is that a bit, a bit more common to have a, or you don't have T1114? It's almost uh, identical. It, it's important to know that also other subtypes of uh, diseases have 1114. And uh, one example, for example, is, is multiple myeloma. So, of course, we have to consider uh, cytomorphology. But once we are in, in, let's say, in the setting of non-Hodgkin lymphoma and we do have a high expression of uh, or, or strong signal of 1114, we're quite positive that it's a uh, mantle cell. And other than obviously we've talked a bit about the kind of histopathology and the characteristic features there, but even before you get the biopsy back, is there anything that kind of uh, makes you suspicious that a patient might have mantle cell lymphoma rather than DLBCL or another type of lymphoma in the clinical history? Well, clinical wise, first of all, it's an important difference to, to, to DLBCL. In DLBCL, you have to start right away with treatment. And mantle cell lymphoma, you always have some time to reconsider. So we are not so much in a hurry. However, what is the typical thing about mantle cell lymphoma? It's extranodal involvement. So GI involvement is, is, is very frequent. Then, you know, sometimes it's leukemic disease, and then it seems to be a little bit more aggressive than CLL. So there are some certain points, and, and then there's also something like marginal type of mantle cell lymphoma. So frequently, it's just in between, let's say, our classical categories. Sounds good. So next, we will uh, jump into the leukemic type or the smoldering myeloma. So how does the leukemic type or smoldering, I'm sorry, I, mantle cell lymphoma, I'm used to saying myeloma, so that kind of jumped out from my mouth. So how does the leukemic type or smoldering mantle cell lymphoma typically present? And uh, what are its characteristic features? And then the next question is that can it be safely observed in some situations without any treatment? Uh, the second question, I start with that one because answer is very short, yes. Uh, it can be just watched and wait. And that's standard approach in the vast majority of cases. Now, the first question is, what about these, uh, quote, low risk? Uh, and it, officially, it's called leukemic non-nodal mantle cell lymphoma. Now, we can identify them uh, also by immunophenotyping because typically these cases are SOX11 negative. However, uh, we discourage in the international guidelines to perform SOX11 because uh, what I do believe the field is moving to that we lump together, let's say the more indolent, either leukemic or uh, um, classical nodal uh, mantle cell lymphoma, because in these cases, um, treatment uh, lines are quite similar as in indolent lymphoma. That is, we tend to watch and wait, and only if they have symptoms or a high tumor load, then we step into treatment. Sounds good. So what is typically the KI-67 cutoff? Like, do these patients have a low KI-67, like those who have leukemic or smoldering mantle cell lymphoma? Exactly. So, so why is this so well accepted that these leukemic cases, the leukemic non-nodal, the important thing is the non-nodal, not the leukemic one, um, are more beneficial or have a more uh, superior outcome? The answer is really because it's closely related to less genetic alterations. It's closely related to lower 
clinical risk scores, the so-called MIPI, and, and uh, so it all falls into place. So you can also identify these low risk uh, cases by other features, let's say that. Sounds good. So we wanted to pick your brain on some practical questions like uh, do patients with newly diagnosed and you know, advanced stage mantle cell lymphoma stage three or four, do they always need a bone marrow biopsy at diagnosis? Do you always do a bone marrow in them? Uh, I would strongly advise that. And uh, on the other hand, you should, because mantle cell lymphoma is frequently involving uh, the bone marrow. And if you perform molecular diagnostics, you will detect that in almost 100%. On the other hand, you should only do that in clinical routine, which is outside of, of, of clinical trials, only if it does change treatment, fair to say, or if you have a, you know, some blood count alterations. If the blood count is normal and you see there already in the differential blood count some lymphocytosis, so then it's definitely uh, also in the bone marrow. But, but as I said, if a blood count is normal, then you don't have to perform really the bone marrow biopsy. But I would like to step back to your previous question. I did not answer. I'm sorry for that. What about the magic cutoff of ki 67 and we publish it everywhere 30 percent and uh, our colleagues from MD Anderson promote the cutoff of 50 percent. What is the difference? Well first of all it, it needs a good pathologist because I was told I'm not a pathologist I was told by the pathologist that it's crucial that you only count the mantle cell and not the reactive T cells and then you come up with different ki 67 values and otherwise to be honest, there is not just one cutoff. You can make it 30, you can 40, 50, 70. The higher you are, the worse the outcome. Simple thing. And in the initial days, we really analyzed to see whether we have two separate subsets of patients. You know, whether we opt, uh, can define an optimal um, cutoff and there's none. So what we only can say, the, the blastoid spectrum starts above 30%. So I just wanted to clarify, if a patient has nodal disease, but they have a low CART Q67 of say 20%, is that a patient that you're also comfortable watching and waiting? Or is if they, by definition, if they have nodal disease, that makes you want to treat them? No, if it's a low tumor burden, we more and more tend to watch and wait. And if you would have asked me that, let's say 20 years ago, I would just have said the opposite. But, you know, we are human beings, we are able to learn. And, and that is what we, we really experienced during the last uh, 20 years, that you don't have to hurry in the vast majority of cases. If tumor load is low, if, if it's, uh, there's no biological risk factor, which is ki 67 or P53 alteration, there is no need to start treatment right away. And there are additional clinical hints. For example, these patients with GI involvement only, I already mentioned the a non-nodal or extranodal involvement and only a little bit of bone marrow infiltration but nothing else yeah definitely watch and wait and you know i'm following the a couple of these patients for years and you know it's true at some time the disease will wake up but you know in my patient or my recollection the patients can just be followed for about three four five years something like that and in my opinion, the best treatment is no treatment because it doesn't have any side effects. And so then to sort of continue down that line, if you're, if you're watching and waiting one of these uh, patients, do you use something similar to like the GELF criteria, like in follicular lymphoma to decide when you treat them or how do you make a decision then to switch modes or is it exactly. usually pretty obvious? No, it's absolutely like you're saying, you know, there is no de defined cutoff in none of the disease. So gel GELF is also being based on gut feeling and we follow the same gut feeling. We, we tend to start a little bit earlier, but let's say I have, you know, I, I'm a fan of simple rules and my rules for the patients is uh, um, a lymph node below two, two centimeters is no lymph node. I don't care at all. And therefore, if all lymph nodes are, be, uh, you know, smaller than two centimeters, who cares? Uh, and only if, you know, if they're three centimeters and above and, and not three times one centimeter, but three times three centimeters, then I start to consider starting treatment. Sounds good. So um, as you know, MCL has very commonly has GI involvement. So uh, do patients with newly diagnosed MCL need an endoscopy? When do you consider doing an endoscopy in these patients when you are first evaluating them? 
According to a historical series, in fact, from MD Anderson, there are up to 60% of patients who do have gut involvement. And in fact, in contrast to what you would expect, this mostly is a, a more favorable prognostic sign. So I already mentioned these cases with GI involvement only, they tend to, to, to have a more indolent course. And, and if you check in these cases, ki 67, it's normally between five to 10%. Having said that all, uh, it's not life-threatening. It, it really induces start of treatment. So I perform endoscopy only if uh, the patient is symptomatic. So if there's some diarrhea or something like that, then of course we perform that, but we're not performing it on a routine base, although it might be missed by standard PET-CT staging. Right. Uh, do you use uh, MIPI or Mantle Cell Lymphoma International Prognostic Score to influence your treatment decision making? For example, in our case, the MIPI was seven. Um, how do you incorporate it in your practice and, and your approach to newly diagnosed patient? This is a critical question, and I, I, I'm sorry I have to discourage you um, because we, we established the MIPI, and by the way, M sta doesn't stand for Munich, it does stand for Mantel cell. But anyway, no, it was never meant to guide treatment. So the purpose was, in fact, to compare different patient populations in different studies, full stop, that's it all. And the only thing which tailors treatment in our experience in fact are very simple things first of all classical risk scores patient's performance status which is related but not identical to age and secondly aggressiveness of, of the disease which may be simply reflected by ldh very standard lab result if it comes to biology we look for p53 and we look for keo 67 and that has been now also implemented in the current well you know we are we are very humble as lymphoma experts we, we not only need one classification now we have two classifications which is the who and the cat classification and it's all about human uh, interaction but anyway um, so this is now standard of care according to both of these classifications classifications and that according to these parameters we tend to tailor treatment great i'd love to move now to talk about treatment before we get to shine and triangle let's talk about what the what the world looked like 12 months ago to kind of set the stage to talk about those two trials so if you've got a fit patient such as the one described in our case is 55 with no past medical history what's your preferred upfront treatment for mantle cell lymphoma it's always, or it had been always, immunochemotherapy. So combination of this anti-CD20 antibody plus chemotherapy. And it has been always antibody maintenance. So, you know, uh, just uh, as you know that, meanwhile, a fan of simple rules. If you think mantle cell lymphoma, think maintenance, simple thing. Because that was really a major improvement of outcome uh, of our patients. And secondly, I already mentioned, let's say one, two years ago, what we did do, we tailored the kind of treatment according to the aggressiveness of the lymphoma. So for example, in elderly patients, somewhat worldwide, uh, bendamustine is one standard of care in these patients been combined with rituximab. Now, bendamustine is perfect for the classical mantle cell lymphoma without additional risk factors. However, if LDH is, is skyrocket high, or if there is ki 67 let's say as of 70%, as in this case, uh, bendamustine will not do the job, simple, uh, simply said. And in these patients, we tend to move to a more aggressive treatment, either CHOP or in younger patients, even some cytarabine containing regimen. That's a great uh, segue, because the next thing I wanted to ask you is whether you have any preference between one cytarabine containing regimen or the other, or whether you think as long as there's some cytarabine in there, that's, that's the, main, the main thing for a young fit patient with mental cell lymphoma. So we learned a lot about this. Uh, so again, uh, you know, a couple of years ago when we started, I, I can't tell you a secret 
because you know we are just in our inner circle so uh, no one dares to say that but when we thought well what can we do to improve outcome of Monticellum form at that time we already knew that the problem are the highly proliferating cells so these are the poor performers and therefore we said well let's just take one drug from acute leukemia because these are rapidly dividing cells and that is cytarabine and toss it in and see what comes out so that was the starting point and meanwhile this is well established and what is the difference well you know every one of us has strong feelings who cares about free links we should have a look into the data and we did perform in fact some comparisons between different regimens and simply it's been said between the different flavors of the european protocols they are very very similar to each other when you compare that to the hyper-CVAT regimen, uh, which has been established by MD Anderson for ALL, or originally uh, this is does achieve similar results, but it is more toxic, and therefore we avoid it. Meanwhile, and a lot of your centers avoid that. Now, question is: Is cytoperbine really a magic drug? No, it's not, because that has been also explored. That was our Scandinavian colleagues who started a study in very high risk Montessori lymphoma, really even increasing the dose of cytarabine, and they stopped the study early because it was not a home run. Out of the first 10 patients or so, four were uh, therapy refractory. And the reason is cytarabine alone does not make the job, but it has to be combined with some alkylating drug. And that is why, for example, the Italian RBAC is so efficient. That is why we still keep the DHAP with platinum and oxalate platinum is better tolerated than cis platinum, but it's the same principle. Yeah, great. But so, so the, the, the general idea is if you can get some cytarabine in there, that, that probably will help. But and and probably the European regimens are a little bit less toxic than hypercevad. But if you can get some cytarabine in there, then it's worthwhile adding it in. Do you think if we don't, if we do not have access to uh, BTK inhibitors, do you think all fit patients should receive it, with mantle cell lymphoma should receive an upfront autologous transplant? No, I don't think so. Uh, so first of all, the most important question is, do we have to treat these patients at all? So watch and wait, even in the younger patients, as mentioned, is the you know one important option. Secondly, once we start treatment, I think it's still important to consider what kind of disease we're talking about. And there are these clearly indolent subtypes, for example, the non-nodal leukemic disease, normal LDH, no P53 mutation. And these cases, which may have progressed slowly over decades, there you, I would still consider bendamustine only, combination with rituximab and rituximab maintenance. However, the more aggressive the kind of disease, I probably would more switch into adding the autologous transplant. Great. I think now we'll jump to talk a bit about unfit patients with how we approach unfit patients with mantle cell lymphoma, Raj? Yeah, sure. So what's your approach with the upfront treatment of an unfit or an older patient? Like, do you prefer a BR, you know, versus R mini job versus single agent BTK inhibitor? What's your you know, usual approach to these patients? So unfortunately, I'm living in Europe. So in US, my, my question, my answer would be probably totally different because what we do know that at least for the low risk patients, they're pretty well off with uh, BTKI as a monotherapy or in combination with rituximab. There are at least two phase two studies from both sides of the Atlantic. However, this is off label in, in Europe and therefore we have to stick to some chemotherapy based regimens. And rituximab monotherapy has a limited role because their response is only in the range of 30%. So if we are considering these patients, we are considering rituximab plus dose reduced regimen. And what kind of regimen? This is really according, well, tailored according to the aggressiveness of disease. So for example, in, in indolent mantle cell lymphoma, we consider 
even 50 milligrams per square meter instead of 90. And the original historical series in Germany, in fact, have been started with such a dose 50 years ago, or nowadays, sorry, 60 years ago. And when the disease is more aggressive, better must I already mentioned that, will not make the job. And then we move on for something like mini chop or if I would argue academic wise, the only approach which has been proven to be superior to CHOP in randomized study is in fact VR cap, so substituting uh, vincristin by bortezomib. And you can also make it VR mini cap. So to make a long story short, reduce chemo because that's the toxic point and adapt to the biology of the disease. Sounds good. Now we will jump to the SHINE trial, you know, the, one of the exciting trials that was published in the last year. So just for the audience, the SHINE was a randomized trial in which Dr. Drayling was obviously one of the PIs um, and led the trial, where patients over 65 years of age were randomized to receive either six cycles of bendamustine rituximab or six cycles of bendamustine rituximab plus continuous ibrutinib until disease progression. And both groups received rituximab maintenance. And the top line results were that the trial showed about a 2.5 year improvement in progression free survival. So far, there has been no improvement in overall survival between the arms. So Dr. Drayling, do you think the SHINE trial was practice changing in your opinion? And how do you see the results? These are tough questions. Well, let me answer that really, really frankly. So per, per definition, the study was positive. The question is, does it really change practice of care? And here we have to have a close look at, at the data. You, you said already the, the two important messages, PFS was significantly improved, but overall survival was not. Why? And there are a couple of explanations for that one. The one thing is median age of patients was above 70 years. So I'm afraid nowadays 70s are middle age from my point of perspective for you, they are whatever stone age. But anyway, we all have to die from some time. So, so that's not that surprising. And if patients are not dying from the lymphoma, they're dying from other causes. And now here, this, and this has been exactly shown in the SHINE trial. Now the question is, well, is that just a point of short follow-up? No, it's not. We have a median follow-up of eight years. So forget about that. So we have an increase of non-lymphoma related death causes. And you could either say, well, it's somewhat substituting because we are, none of us is, is being built for eternal life. Or you could say this is increased toxicity. And no one knows for sure. What I can tell you, we, we really looked into depth of these data and we couldn't really identify one or two clear indicators, which we, are proven to be the, the major well, killer of the study. So everyone is, you know, the glass is half full or half empty. And therefore people are a little bit reluctant to accept that as the one and only standard of care. And we, we have exactly the same uh, impression in Europe as in US. And if you have a broader view and look at a couple of studies testing targeted approaches in combination with Bendamustine in Monticel lymphoma, none of them was positive for overall survival. So it might even be that Bendamustine is not the perfect combination partner. And, and that's a totally different subject. Why that is, I could give you quite some explanations on that but to answer your answer shortly no it's not really changing standards it's you know there are some distinct patients where you should and may consider that for example the patients with p53 mutations there are strong arguments in favor of that although the subgroup analysis in the study was not convincing and that was due to small numbers of patients Sounds good. So as you may have seen recently, the FDA recently requested the manufacturer to withdraw Ibrutinib's mantle cell lymphoma and marginal zone lymphoma indication. So obviously you're not based in the US, but what do you think of this decision of the FDA? Well, it, it's quite interesting. So we have some advantages and some disadvantages in Europe. And our, our advantage is, is that Ibrutinib was not withdrawn from the European market, so we can still work on that. The disadvantage is, in comparison to the US, you have at least 
two other BDKIs registered in Monza cell lymphoma, which, is, uh, which are acalabrutinib and zanobrutinib, and that's not the case in Europe. So for us, we don't have any alternative for ibrutinib. Now, having said that, the decision of FDA without knowing really the details, I think was a very formal decision. So that is because the compound had a fast track registration. And if you have a fast track registration, you have to provide some confirmatory phase three trials. And FDA considered the SHINE trial we just discussed, you know, I said half full or half empty. For FDA, it was half empty. They said there's no improvement of overall survival. And of course, they also had in mind that there are two other compounds being registered in US, fairly been taken. And therefore, it was a formal decision saying, well, 10 years after registration, we have no positive phase three trials, in our opinion, and therefore we, we don't support the, the registration of ibrutinib and mantle cell lymphoma anymore. But it's a bizarre situation because now we have the positive data even in for overall survival for an ibrutinib combination, but you're not able to, to apply that. And the question is, what are you doing in US? I don't know. Uh, our US colleagues would probably transfer these data on the other BTKI, but you tell me probably uh, how you manage this situation. Well, we're absolutely coming to that question very shortly. So now let's discuss the triangle trial, for which you presented the first results at American Cytohematology meeting in December 2022. Congratulations on the plenary session presentation, what I think are indeed practice changing results. Now the trial design is a little bit complex, so let me do my best to get it right and you can correct me if I, if I stuff anything up. So triangle was a randomized open label three arm trial of transplant eligible under 66 year old advanced stage previously untreated mantle cell lymphoma patients. The first arm, arm A, got three cycles of each of RCHOP and RDHAP without ibrutinib, followed by autologous stem cell transplant. The second arm, I, received the same, so three cycles of RCHOP and three cycles of RDHAP, but ibrutinib was added to the RCHOP cycles and two years of maintenance ibrutinib and no stem cell transplant. The third arm, which you called arm A plus I, got ibrutinib added to their RCHOP cycles, uh, then their three cycles of RDHAP as well, plus an autologous stem cell transplant, plus two years of ibrutinib maintenance. And you adjusted the trial so that about 55%, 54 to 58% of patients in each arm received maintenance rituximab as that practice changed during the trial. And the primary outcome you defined as failure-free survival, which basically included stable disease at the end of induction, progression or death, all counted as events. How did I go and what were the results that you presented at ASH? Well, let's rephrase. This is a typical, well, very complicated study design. You would probably say, well, this is typical European. And you're right to some extent, because why did we pick a three-arm design? Because there was a consensus on the standard arm, but there was no consensus on the experimental arm. So some people said, well, we have to keep the autologous transplant anyway, and therefore we added ibrutinib. And the other one said, well, we want to get rid of autologous and of course, of course, want to get rid of late toxicity. And in this arm, we substituted autologous transplant by ibrutinib. And we couldn't agree on one solution. And it was really 50-50 in each of the national study groups. And then at a certain point, I try, really tried to push. I had a very strong feeling, let's say. I won't tell you anyway. So at a certain point, we gave up and said, okay, we're going to make a free arm study, which we required three randomized comparisons, uh, one arm against each other, and, and that resulted in almost 900 patients. Incredible number. Uh, at that time, we were not sure whether we could achieve it. But that also caused the very complicated statistics for the add-on comparison. So autologous plus minus I, it's simple. We said, well, it's, it has to be definitely superior to really justify the additional ibrutinib. And yes, it was. PFS was improved by 15% after three years, so really a major benefit. And even overall survival was improved by 5%. So really quite convincing data. So that's one point. The other comparison was, and that's even more complicated, the head-to-head -head comparison. 
and there we did not dare to believe that ibrutinib is better than autologous transplant. So we said, well, it should not be worse, having in mind that autologous transplant means toxicity. And therefore, if we can skip these toxicity, that would be even fine for us. And what is the result? Well, numerically, ibrutinib, and that was unexpected also for me, was superior and again, it was a major improvement by 15% after three years, and also a plus of 5% of overall survival after three years. Now, therefore, the, the statistical jury on the study is, well, first of all, it's positive. So that's clearly we fulfilled all this. But then we can also say, only say we rejected superiority of autologous transplant versus ibrutinib. However, if you see the curves, and this is how all our clinicians are reading this curve, if the PFS, the kaplan meyer goes up, of course, you, you prefer the higher curve, right? And that's the ibrutinib arm. So numerically, it's superior, but formally, we're not allowed to say that because it was not the predefined question. Yeah, totally. I can understand both the appeal of the three-arm trial to kind of answer both questions, and avoid, if possible, avoid the toxicity of that, that the autologous transplant, but how that can make the statistical interpretation slightly more complex. So how do you think this will change your, or shape your practice, the results of the trial? Well, in Germany, luckily we are a wealthy country and therefore it did already change standard of care. So for the majority of patients, we skip autologous transplant already now. So it's not yet registered. So we have to apply individually to our health insurances and they double check. And we also discussed with their, how would you say, the medical advisory group, and they are convinced about the data. So they accept these applications and therefore if a patient comes into a hospital and not only in our, and in, in, let's say nationwide more or less, and starts treatment for Monster cell lymphoma, they start with our chemo plus oibrutinib. Now, the question is whether we still should keep autologous transplant, which does buy in additional toxicity. And here it becomes very confusing because I did not mention the third comparison, which is oibrutinib plus minus autologous transplant. And in fact, so far the curves are overlapping and that holds up for both PFS and overall survival. And when it, I already mentioned, when it comes to toxicity, maybe that is, that is logical that skipping autologous transplant does improve the tolerability of the schedule. So how do we approach it right now? Well, for the standard risk patient, and that's again, driven by ki 67 by P53 mutation. We skip autologous transplant already now. And in the high risk uh, cases where we are not sure whether they, at the end of the day, may benefit from addition of uh, autologous transplant, we still keep it until we have the final analysis of the triangle trial. Great. And coming to a point that you sort of hinted at earlier, which is particularly salient for US clinicians, do you think the you can superimpose or you could substitute a calibrutinib or xanabrutinib into a kind of triangle-like regimen, particularly in the US? So there are essentially two, two hearts beating in my chest. So one thing is I'm always very much evidence-based and that is what you are as a hematology oncologist. So I would always say, well, show me the data. On the other hand, being in your shoes, having these data and having no chance to get ibrutinib, my common sense is that the second generation BTKIs are quite similar when it comes to efficacy and that holds up for both Akala and Zonobrutinib. And but there is a, a slight difference of toxicity. In fact, about 50% reduced for both Akala and Zonobrutinib. So therefore, if I, with my knowledge, would be practicing in, in, in US, this is exactly what I would do. I don't know whether you get through the health system uh, when it comes to reimbursement. And I don't ask you and challenge you to ask for your tricks, tips and tricks to, do, to achieve that, but that I think would be a logical idea. 
No, I think I was thinking this question in, even as you presented the trial in December before the Brutiny withdrawal happened only a few weeks ago, but I think that's a really important question, particularly for anyone who's based in the US, although we do have listeners practicing in lots of different places around the world. I think if we say stick to upfront treatment of mantle cell lymphoma, I want to ask, do you think every mantle cell lymphoma patient uh, should get next generation sequencing for T53 at diagnosis? And how does it change your result? Uh, How does it change your approach? Well, absolutely, it should be done. And why is that? Well, first of all, in mantle cell lymphoma specifically, mutation have a much stronger prognostic impact in comparison to deletion. So this is a different story than in CLL. And secondly, it's really a major shift of prognosis. So if we are applying chemotherapy only, it might be the best of whatever kind of chemotherapy, median PFS is only in the range of, let's say, one and a half years. That is really not a very nice expectation for a young patient. And in fact, this subset of patients benefit most of the addition of ibrutinib. So with a, in fact, a hazard ratio of 0.15. So this is a huge benefit, right? Six times more than six times better outcome. And why is that? Well, the only study I know which has a similar hazard ratio is in fact comparing chloramicil with ibrutinib in, in first line CLL. So for these patients, in my opinion, it's a must be that they should receive an BDKI containing first line treatment. And are you, as I, as you can probably hear, have trained in Australia where venetoclax in mantle cell lymphoma in combination with anibrutinib is, is popular. Is, what are your thoughts on that? And as a sort of follow-up, what are your thoughts on allograft in, in mantle cell lymphoma? Both very Australian questions, I realize. The one thing is, let's say, start with the first one. So Germany is, in fact, a venetoclux country, at least when it comes to CLL, where the German CLL group has established this as one standard of care in first-line treatment. So we are very knowledgeable of the benefits of venetoclux. Now, when you compare these two first-line treatments, it seems to be that uh, with venetoclux only, you achieve only short-term remissions in mantle cell lymphoma. So the only option is, uh, well, what about the combination? Is that better than ibrutinib only or same for other BTKIs. And luckily, we have a randomized study for that, Sympatico, which is close to read out. And that will really tell us the answer. My gut feeling is, let's say I'm, I'm partially Australian, if you want so. Uh, I, my strong belief is BTK only, BTKI only is good for low risk patients, but for all mantle cell lymphoma patients, really, I would go into the combination of venetoclux plus BTKI. In fact, this is exactly the study we have activated in our center just today, an academic trial, first line in mantle cell lymphoma. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the first randomized study, which will compare the old standard, which is chemotherapy containing induction. In in, in this setting, it's BR plus I versus a non-chemo approach. And we picked ibrutinib plus venetoclux plus rituximab. And it will be very interesting to finally see the readout. It might be, you know, one of the last studies still comparing to chemotherapy first line. So one final question regarding all the exciting trials that's going on in mantle cell lymphoma right now. What are, you know, the one or two landmark randomized control trials currently ongoing that you're looking forward to in coming years that you think might shape the practice and change the standard of care? I come back to that question, but I first of all would like to address, sorry, I, I'm European, I'm slow. The, the question about allotransplant and, and allotransplant steps back. So if you are I was going to let you off the hook, but I'm glad you've come back to it. Yeah. So if you are able to apply immunotherapeutic approaches, which is either CAR T cells, which is registered and reimbursed in Europe, or the currently in studies investigated by specific antibodies, I I think we will see the same as in in other subtypes of lymphoma that allotransplant will step back. In fact, you know, we we have performed one of the few prospective studies of allotransplant in mantle cell lymphoma and outcome is not that good, to be honest. So we're talking about at that time, 
relapsed allo transplant at three years media the pfs was around 50 60 percent which is not great so uh, i think allo transplant is still an option once immunotherapeutic approaches fail and then that's still you know a backup but not before Having said that, what are the, the next breakthrough studies? I, I think there are two groups, let's say. The one thing is really stepping forward in earlier lines with the so-called, well, nowadays, salvage treatments. And I mentioned already the CAR T cells. I mentioned the bispecific antibodies. One may also discuss the non-covalent BTKI. Pertobutinib is the, the front runner of this group of compounds. And this will, in fact, do strongly believe in five to 10 years from now, change first-line treatment. So my hope is that we may be able to substitute chemotherapy by these better tolerated besides financial aspects, better tolerated treatments. Now, having said that, this has to be proven in, in randomized trials. And I'm lucky as the coordinator of the European MCL network, we're performing two of these academic trials and the one I already mentioned and in younger high risk patients. And that's been defined again, ki 67 high P53, we uh, compare CAR T cells to immunochemotherapy, both in combination with BTKI. And th that will be also very interesting. Very interesting. Well, thank you for a fascinating uh, chat about all things mantle cell lymphoma, especially the SHINE and Triangle trials. It's been a delight having you on our, on our podcast and we look forward to chatting to you again soon. Perfect, thank you. Thank you.